Welcome to The Loop Podcast, where we are transforming education in plastic surgery since 2020. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Loop Podcast. Today's episode is a resident in-service review of congenital hand. This is a supplementary episode and not a comprehensive review. This is a breakdown of key points from previous examinations that may help if you're studying for boards or in-service. Today, I'm excited to have my residency partner in crime, Dr. Matthew Ziderman, who will be co-chief with me next year at UC Davis. Hey, Matt, welcome. Tell everyone a little bit about yourself. Hey, Sam. Thanks for having me today. So I grew up in Northern California and did undergrad at UC Berkeley. Went to the University of Louisville in Louisville, Kentucky for medical school. And then I was fortunate enough to come back to Northern California for my training. Right now I'm applying for hand fellowships. So we'll see where the next couple of years take me. Exciting. Okay, let's get started. We can't talk about congenital hand without starting off talking about embryology. Let's focus on the exam favorite timing of limb development. So the upper limbs develop between weeks four to eight. And let's break down what's going on in these four weeks a little bit more. By week four, you have the upper limb bud emerges. By week five, the upper limbs have formed without digital separation. And by week six, which is around day 38 to 40, you have digital separation that's occurring. And the way to remember this is when you give someone a high five, all your fingers are basically together. So you can use that as an example of week five, no digital separation, high five. Week six, the digits start to separate. By week eight, there's complete upper limb development. And week nine to 10 is when the fingernails start to form. Again, I'm going to emphasize the high yield area for the exam is differentiating between week five, aka high five, aka no digit separation, and week six, where the digits start to separate. Now, Matt, tell us a little bit more about the genes and the process of development. So the limb develops in a proximal to distal direction from your shoulder to your wrist, and this is controlled by the apical ectodermal ridge, otherwise known as the AER. This is a thickened layer of ectoderm overlying the limb bud. The AER secretes FGF, fibroblast growth factor, and signals the underlying mesoderm to differentiate. And disruption of the AER results in truncation of the limb. Growth in the radial ulnar axis is determined by the zone of polarizing activity, the ZPA. This is located in the posterior margin of the limb bud, and sonic hedgehog protein is secreted and acts to signal development of the limb into the radial and ulnar aspects. Alterations in this pathway can result in deformities such as mirror hand. The dorsal ventral axis of development is signaled by the Wnt pathway. This produces a transcription factor, LMX1, that induces the development of the dorsal structures. Now let's focus on the congenital hand anomalies themselves. They have a classification system that's not commonly used today because of many confounding variables, but grouping in this way will make it easier for you guys to follow along with our discussion. So when you're focusing on upper limb anomalies, there's different ways they can have an anomaly. And Matt, why don't you walk us through the different categories? So there's failure formation where you have missing parts, and there's two ways that this can occur. You can have either a transverse deficiency or a longitudinal deficiency. You can have failure of differentiation of parts, and this is where parts are there, but there's some type of anomaly. There are duplications, like polydactyly or mirror hand, and then overgrowths, like macrodactyly. There can also be undergrowths, issues like the constriction band syndrome. And finally, there's global anomalies, like Apert syndrome. Now we're going to look at some of the specific hand anomalies under the different categories, one by one. So starting off with the first group that is related to failure of formation. Like we mentioned before, there's two ways you can stop forming. One of them is transverse deficiency, the thing congenital hand amputations. Not much more to say about these, except that the most common site is the proximal one-third of the forearm. And another example is focomelia, which is truncated limb associated with thalidomide drug. The second group is a longitudinal deficiency, and we're really going to dive into this one. The type of longitudinal deficiency you have is related to the bones that are missing. So think radial deficiency, ulnar deficiency, or central deficiency. Now, before we discuss these deficiencies, I want you to imagine your upper limb axis. And if you have your hand palm up, a straight line axis going from your shoulder to your fingertip at the center of that limb. 
Anything radial to that line would be considered preaxial, and anything ulnar to it would be considered postaxial. And this axis just has to do with how the upper limb bud grows. So now we can break them down. With a radial deficiency, you need to consider a preaxial malformation. And this deficiency has a whole range from shortening of your radius to complete absence of your radius. With a radial club hand, you see shortening of the forearm with a hypoplastic or absent radius, and there's also radial deviation of the wrist. Treatment encompasses centralization of the carpus with release of soft tissue and possible carpal resection or an ulnar osteotomy, depending on the deformity. The radial longitudinal deficiencies are associated with other anomalies. There's Holter worm syndrome. With this one, you need to think about cardiac defects, like ventricular septal defects or valvular defects. There's Vactoral, V-A-C-T-E-R-L, which stands for vertebral, anal, cardiac, esophageal fistula, radial, and low extremity anomalies and defects. TAR, T-A-R, which stands for thrombocytopenia absent radius syndrome. This one you often see an absent radius with a normal thumb. And finally, there's Fanconi's anemia. And this is one of those can't miss diseases when you see a child with radio longitudinal deficiency. It needs to be diagnosed while they're young, that there's still an opportunity to get them a bone marrow transplant before developing an aplastic anemia. And this is tested with a DNA breakage test. Matt, is there a reason why we do the DNA breakage test to diagnose these patients? Yeah, you can't diagnose this syndrome or the Fanconi is an anemia based on just a peripheral blood test or a blood smear. The aplastic anemia doesn't manifest until they're several years older. Another type of longitudinal deficiency is ulnar deficiency, aka postaxial. This is sporadic and uncommon, and it's commonly seen with lower extremity anomalies. And don't forget, there's the central longitudinal deficiency, which results in a cleft hand. There's usually absent or deficient central digits in this issue. It's autosomal dominant, and there's a deficit of the central AER. There's a variable deficiency of the first web space from narrowing to a complete syndactyly, in which you might have fusion of the thumb to the index finger. The degree of your web space abnormality usually dictates treatment. Most of these patients, despite the aesthetic appearance, actually have pretty good functional outcomes with their hands. The indication for treatment is to restore hand function, such as when they lack thumb opposition. You can imagine with syndactyly, you're going to have to operate. And when we're talking about cleft hand, there's two types to consider, typical cleft hand and atypical cleft hand. With a typical cleft hand, it's autosomal dominant and there's limb involvement, especially the foot. There's foot deformities with this one. It's bilateral, familiar, and syndactyly is common, especially in the first web space. You see a V-shaped cleft and it's associated with cleft lip and palate. Atypical cleft hand, on the other hand, is spontaneous and usually unilateral. There's sporadic limb involvement, but doesn't include the feet. And of note, this is associated with Poland syndrome. Moving on to our next main category, or failure of differentiation of parts. This is when the parts are there, but they have some kind of abnormality. So let's start it off with one of the most common congenital hand anomalies, syndactyly. It's 10 times more common in whites than blacks. It's twice as common in men than women, but it's about the same 50-50 unilateral versus bilateral. The long finger and ring finger are most commonly affected versus the thumb and index finger, which is rare. So if you see thumb and index finger syndactyly, think cleft hand. Again, it's autosomal dominant and there's different types. So for simple, think S's. Simple, syndactyly, skin aka only the skin is fused. There's no bony fusion. With complex, there's a presence of bony fusion. With complicated, that's associated with syndrome. So for example, think Alpert versus Poland syndrome. And then there's complete versus incomplete. In complete, the entire length of the finger, including the fingertip and nail is involved. In incomplete, the fingertip and nail is spared. Now this isn't to be confused with acrosyndactyly. In acrosyndactyly, there's some degree of proximal web space between the fingers, but the distal finger has syndactyly. So the way I try to remember it is for the acrosyndactyly, which you should always be thinking about amniotic band syndrome, is that there's a buddy tape around the fingers. So proximally, they have the web space between them, but distally, there's fusion and syndactyly. Versus an incomplete, 
they're syndactyly moving all along the finger from the web space more distally and then the fingertip is spared. X-ray imaging is really important as you can imagine because you wanna evaluate for bony involvement versus is it just skin. If more than one digit is involved, only separate one side of the digit at a time because of the uncertainty of the vascular supply to that digit. Rule of thumb, no pun intended, release of border digits first, AKA thumb and small finger. And it's important to note in an exam favorite that the proximal limit of your digit separation in syndactyly is at the bifurcation of the digital artery, which makes sense, right? Because you're not gonna lay it off the artery supplying the fingers. That's right. You should also know that your most common type of reconstruction for the, at least the web space is gonna be using a proximally based dorsal rectangular collapse. If they've got a complete syndactyly, there's a good chance that you may need a full thickness skin graft in addition to your local flaps and deep plasties. You need to avoid scars and skin grafts in the web space, such as straight line incisions or those full thickness skin grafts, which can cause creep and contracture. Moving on to the next anomaly, campodactyly. It's a congenital flexion contracture of the PIP joint and it's painless. I used to get campodactyly and clinodactyly confused. I don't know if this is helpful for you guys, but the way I started to remember it is I had a camp counselor, camp, campodactyly. I had a camp counselor who for some reason could bend his small finger at the PIPJ and then rotate it out of his can. Now ignore the rotation nonsense and the fact that that just sounded gross, but think my camp counselor's weird trick is PIPJ flexion contracture. Most common in the small finger and it's usually bilateral. The treatment depends on the degree of contracture. Less than 30 degrees loss of PIP extension is observation. About 30 to 60 degrees, you can try splinting and greater than 60 degrees surgery to release the lumbrical and the FDS tendon. So to simplify, vast majority are non off and it's important to note that even if you do surgery on these patients, they have a high failure rate. One thing to note is that if there is associated brachydactyly and a very stiff PIP joint without flexion and extension creases, that's pointing to a failure of joint formation, aka symphalangism, which is different than campodactyly where the PIP joint is present. So if your finger is shorter and you don't see any creases, then you have to think that there's no joint there versus just a contracture at the joint. Excellent. Let's move on to the next anomaly, clinodactyly. This is when there's a curvature of the finger in the radial or ulnar direction. And the curvature is usually a middle phalanx problem. This is best seen on x-ray, where you'll see a bracketed or C-shaped epiphysis wrapped around one side of the bone, which restricts longitudinal growth on that side and can also result in a delta-looking phalanx. The delta phalanx is the name of the triangular shape of that bony wedge that you'll see at the base of your middle phalanx. So the main point, you have problems with longitudinal growth of the finger. Indications for treatment are based on severe shortening of the finger, and you do this in order to restore hand function because the length is needed for pinch. Cosmesis is not an indication for surgery because the scar that develops can affect hand function as well. Treatment options are physiolysis, which works well when the true delta phalanx is present. And that's when you do a bracket resection of the longitudinal physis with preservation of the growth plate. The other option is an osteotomy. And this is indicated when you have a trapezoidal phalanx that's present. Moving on to the next topic, Kerner's deformity. There is excessive volar radial curvature of the distal phalanx with deviation of the DIP of the small finger with clubbed or beaked appearance of the fingernail. So Kerner's deformity has a volar radial curve versus the lateral curves in clinodactyly. On x-ray, you see widening of the physeal plate, lengthening of the volar lip with curve of the diaphysis of the distal phalanx. It can be familial, aka congenital and present at birth versus progressive starting at age five and you start seeing swelling at the distal phalanx and then eventually it leads to deformity over time. Motion at the DIP is preserved, so you usually don't need to operate because function is preserved in these deformities. Now let's focus on another common anomaly, polydactyly. This is when you have more than five digits on your hand, and it's the most common congenital hand anomaly. There are two kinds, radial and ulnar polydactyly, and you got to remember your upper limb axis again. So there's ulnar polydactyly, which is postaxial, and it's more common in African Americans, and there's two types. 
In type A, you have a supernumerary digit that's well developed, and these usually need an operative separation with the transfer of the important parts. This one is also more often associated with syndromes. Type B, you have a rudimentary or pedunculated digit, and this is, can often be done with a suture ligation or a simple snipping in the office or even in the nursery. Then there's radial polydactyly, aka preaxial. It's more common in whites. The Wassel classification is commonly used for thumb duplication. And to understand the classification or to simplify the classification, think bifid phalanx versus a duplicated phalanx. Every time bifid comes before a duplicated and you start distally and work your way proximally. So if you follow that rule, type one, bifid distal phalanx, type two, duplicated distal phalanx, type three, duplicated distal phalanx and a bifid proximal phalanx, type four, a duplicated distal phalanx and a duplicated proximal phalanx. And you can basically work your way down and you see how that goes until you get to type six. And that's a duplicated distal and proximal phalanx and metacarpal. And then type seven, that's the only one associated with a triphalange. So most common is type four, AKA duplicated distal and proximal phalanx. And then for treatment, think ulnar thumb must be preserved because you wanna preserve the ulnar collateral ligament to provide metacarpal phalangeal joint stability for grasping. And then there's the mirror hand. That's a complete duplication of the ulnar aspect of the forearm and hand. And with this one, just automatically think mirror hand, sonic hedgehog gene, and the zone of polarizing activity or ZPA. You typically see central digit with three digits on each side that are the middle ring, small fingers mirrored, no thumb, Alma is duplicated and an absence of the radius. Treatment is you want to resect the extra digits and polycization if there's no thumb. To explain polycization a little bit better, that brings us to the next topic, thumb hypoplasia. Another in-service favorite is the modified block classification of thumb hypoplasia. Matt, can you tell us the different types and treatment? Sure. So there's type one, which is a small but normally functioning thumb, and no treatment is usually needed for this. With a type 2 deformity, you have a contracted web space with an unstable metacarpal phalangeal joint from your ulnar collateral ligament and underdevelopment or absence of intrinsic muscles. Treatment for this is usually opponent's plasty, which is composed of a tendon transfer, give the thumb opposition, and this is usually done with the radial finger FDS tendon. And then there's also often a web space deepening performed with a Z plasty, with or without an ulnar collateral ligament reconstruction based on need. With a type 3A deformity, there are two types of deformities in type 3. You have a small and constricted metacarpal. The base is narrow and constricted, and this is really important because it's almost always tested in this section. What differentiates type 3A from 3B and guides their treatment is that a type 3A CMC joint is stable, with versus a type 3B, the CMC is unstable. Type 4, which is just a floating thumb, it has a small pedicle that holds the floating thumb. And then type five, is, which is a completely absent thumb. So for treatment of these last three types, if your CMC is stable, which is in a type 3A, you can do a reconstruction with tendon transfer, like we mentioned previously, in the opponent's plasty. This is usually done with, like I mentioned, a ring finger FDS tendon, but you can also do what's known as a Huber transfer, in which a hypothenar muscle is transferred. If the CMC joint is unstable, which this is usually going to be type 3B, or any of the more severe deficiencies of the thumb, like a floating thumb or completely absent thumb, then your treatment is going to be pulsization of the index finger. When this is done, the hypoplastic thumb is removed, and the index finger metacarpal and its neurovascular bundle are moved to recreate the thumb. There's a few things worth mentioning with this procedure. First, index finger MCP joint becomes the new thumb CMC joint, and you can figure out the rest of the joints as they translate distally. Second, after the index finger is transferred, it's important to know what functions the different muscles play. So your first palmar interosseous muscle acts as your adductor pollicis. The dorsal interosseous acts like your abductor pollicis brevis. The extensor digitorum communis comes to act as an abductor pollicis longus. And the EIP is used as your EPL tendon. Timing for the surgery is usually about one year of age. Some people do it as early as six months and some prefer to wait until closer to the age of two or three years. Great. Another form of the undergrowth anomaly is brachydactyly. The anomaly entails short finger with all the elements present, 
the bony skeleton of one part is just reduced in size. It's most commonly affecting the middle phalanx of the small finger and ring finger. Treatment, if there's no functional deficit, then you can just observe them. For surgery, you do a distraction osteogenesis. On the opposite end of the spectrum, there's another anomaly, macrodactyly, in which you have a disproportionately large digit. This includes both the soft tissue as well as the skeletal elements of the digit. There are two forms of macrodactyly. There's static, which is present at birth, and then progressive, where you have enlargement of the digit, usually starting at some time early in childhood. This is associated with beckwith weidman syndrome and neurofibromatosis, and the most common manifestation is lipomatous fibromatosis of the nerve. Treatment involves limiting growth with epiphysiodesis or reduction of the digit with debulking of soft tissue and ostectomy. Moving on to amniotic band syndrome or Streeter syndrome, it's spontaneous, not inherited, and it's considered to be an intrauterine accident. The risk factors are prematurity, decreased birth weight, decreased maternal age, multigravita, and oligohydramnia. There's controversy over what causes it, intrinsic versus extrinsic theory. In the extrinsic theory, it's thought that the amniotic band syndrome is when the amnion bands break away from the amniotic sac because of a rupture and wrap around the fetus's body. The problem is the proponents of the intrinsic theory say that some babies have had amniotic band syndrome with a completely intact amniotic sac. Because it was a question on the imp service, it's important to note that amniotic band syndrome makes up 12% of congenital upper limb defects and 14% of congenital lower limb defects. There are four types. Type one, that's just a simple constriction ring. Type two, there's a constriction ring with deformity of the distal part, with or without lymphedema. And in type three, there's a constriction ring with acrosyndactyly. So for acrosyndactyly, think digits have the proximal web space separation, and then the distal aspect is fused together. In type four, there's intrauterine amputation. So for treatment, full thickness constriction excision is important to do, especially to do a subcutaneous release plus the skin and then you add a Z-plasty reconstruction. Finally, there's symbrachydactyly, and this used to be considered an atypical cleft hand, but it really doesn't fit into one category. Symbrachydactyly is a unilateral hand malformation characterized by failure of formation of fingers and the presence of rudimentary nubbins that include elements of nail plate, bone, and cartilage. However, syndactyly may be present as part of this anomaly. Typically, the central digits are absent and the border digits are relatively spared although this is a spectrum, and it's associated with deficiency of the apical ectodermal ridge. Now let's move on to the global category. And the in-service's favorite syndrome is APERT syndrome, or acrocephalus syndactyly. As the name implies, this syndrome consists of coronal cranial synostosis, mid-face hypoplasia with retrusion, and syndactylies of the hand and feet. The defect is in chromosome 10Q, which is the site of the fibroblast growth factor 2 receptor. So to reiterate, the fibroblast growth factor receptor is related to both think apert syndrome and it's associated with the AR, apical ectodermal ridge, and limb bud growth. There are three types of anomalies within the apert syndactyly spectrum. There's type 1, where there's syndactyly of the second through fourth digits of the free thumb. This is thought of as a spade hand. In type 2, you have syndactyly of the second through fourth digits with a simple syndactyly of the thumb, and this is known as a mitten hand. Finally, there's type 3 deformity with complex syndactyly of all digits with a complex thumb syndactyly. With this one, you think about a rosebud hand. Now this last anomaly, pediatric trigger thumb, is a pediatric anomaly, but it is not a congenital hand abnormality. So it's not present at birth, and I emphasize this really loudly. It's a progressive IP flexion contracture. It's caused by A1 pulley constriction with nodular thickening of the FPL or the flexor pollicis longus, and it's called the node as node. There's a short period of observation, about six months, where about half to one third of these patients will resolve. If not, then surgical release before age five is recommended. Okay, this concludes our episode. Matt, thanks for joining us today. And everyone else, thanks for listening to our quick and non-comprehensive review of congenital hand. 
you like our podcast, please spread the word, tell a friend, like us on Facebook, watch this on YouTube, and follow us on Instagram at The Loop Podcast to get in the loop.